Good evening, everyone, and a special hello to Carrington. I think you guys are listening and having a garden club meeting tonight, and I'm, I'm not there. So we will talk about growing June berries here in, in North Dakota. This is kind of a little map of uh, the state of North Dakota, and the Carrington Research Center is kind of that red dot on the kind of center right-hand side of the state. Uh, we have pretty nice soils in that part of the state, and I think a lot of you probably have nice soils too. Um, I Let's see here. Oh, I just want to show you the project. I, I show this at every talk I give, but this is the orchard that we have. And it's about six and a half acres that's enclosed, but the fruit area is about two and a half to three acres. And we have a lot of different things, but um, tonight we'll talk about the June berries and they are in the, on the lower front on the kind of left side there. So we have uh, 100 June berry plants. And this little graphic is, and I drew this by myself, so I don't know how accurate it is. I was reading, I was reading a, a written description of how or where June berries grow in North America. And so from that written description, I just let my hand travel along. So um, it's probably a good general idea, but this purpley gray area, that's kind of where this, this June berry is. This one is Amelanchier olifolia. And there are different kinds of Juneberry or Saskatoon. Um, Saskatoon and Juneberry, really the same thing, different names for the same type of plant. But the species that we have, the Ulnifolia, it grows as a shrub. And these shrubs can grow from, say, five feet tall to maybe 15 or 18 feet tall. They can get quite large. Uh, you can manage them by pruning to keep them a little shorter, which is what we do. Um, but there are different kinds of June berries all across the U.S. On the eastern side of the country, we have um, plants that are more like trees. They, they were where I lived in Wisconsin. Um, they're kind of an understory tree, about 20 feet tall. And all the other trees, their buds would just be breaking, and there would be this beautiful cloud of little white flowers uh, in the forest. You know, they're not really dense, um, but even sometimes even today as we travel back through Wisconsin and get through that central part of the state and if we go in the spring like this Easter time um, I can see June berries blooming in the forest there so it's always it's kind of nice and I have picked wild June berries there in the forest off of these trees it wasn't a huge amount like the nice June berries we have here but uh, it, it's still pretty good so I kind of want to say that the home range the home of the, the, the of where all the species or all the the what is it? The center of genetic diversity, where it comes from in North America, I have to feel like it's in Saskatoon and Alberta. Uh, I've talked to people from Canada and they talk about all these shrubs just growing wild everywhere on the edge of the forest. And most of our cultivars that we use for growing for um, commercial, uh, com commercial or homeowners uh, come from Canada. These are some of the best cultivars we have. So probably the center of diversity is more north of North Dakota, but um, Juneberry, native all across North Dakota. So um, not as common as it used to be. Uh, here's a picture of what it looks like if you've never seen it. A lot of older people in our community will tell me that I used to go and pick Juneberries, uh, but now the plants aren't there anymore. So I'm not sure why the plants aren't there either. It could be different climates, uh, you know, more, more, um, Warm weather in the spring, perhaps, maybe less rainfall, but it might also do, be due to herbicide drifting. You know, there's um, the herbicides that kill the broadleaf plants can kind of drift in the wind. And I have heard that Juneberries are susceptible to these, although, you know, I have not seen specific symptoms of, of damage on our plants. Uh, but, you know, it can just be the, the, the little bit of exposure over time can kind of weaken them and weaken them and that can kind of do it. Um, but anyway, there, there are your June berries. In this slide, I just kind of want to show you what we get out of our June berries. Uh, in the, so when we planted them, we planted them in 2007 and they were just like a one to one and a half foot little shoots and they came in little pots those little two inch pots that are about three and a half inches deep uh, so they came as these little shoots and we plant them kind of deeper than um, because they can do a lot of buds a lot of roots going out when you plant them and uh, so we just kind of watch them for a few years i mulch them with wood chips and we still keep wood chips on them um, they are a forest plant 
you know, in, in, in some species, so um, the wood chips are not uh, bad for them. They keep the moisture in, keep the roots cool. That's kind of nice. Um, so in our fourth year, we got uh, almost two pounds of fruit per plant. That was pretty good. Our seventh year in 2013, we got almost four pounds per plant. And I was pretty excited about that. I thought that was pretty good. And then last year in 2016, um, I pruned them. I really, I really did a good job pruning them. I removed a lot of older wood. It's good to get some of that older wood out after it gets to be about four years old. You'll reduce the height that way and you'll have more vigorous shoots coming from the ground. And so I really pruned them. I feel like I removed at least a quarter and maybe one third of the buds. And by the time I was getting towards the end of pruning, um, I could see the buds were swelling and every time I made a cut, I went, oh, there goes fruit. Oh, there goes fruit. And I felt kind of bad about it. But look at the bumper crop we had, seven and a half pounds of fruit per plant in, the, in our 10th year. That was a lot. We harvested about, uh, about 750, 760 pounds of fruit last year. It, it was amazing. We actually had to ask for storage at our local grocery store. Thank you very much. Um, to store it because we ran out of space by uh, at the research center. So anyway, just wanted to just comment on our production. And just these few notes, and we're going to cover these in the next slides, that there are a lot of native diseases for Juneberries. Um, it's really something you just can't get around. I thought we wouldn't have a problem in Carrington because there aren't any native Juneberries around us. But sure enough, we have all these problems over the years. Um, we hand harvest our June berries. I'm not sure how well they would work to do some kind of mechanical harvesting that we know of up in Saskatoon, uh, big plantings. There's like maybe 2,400 acres up there and they do use over the world harvesters to harvest their plants. Um, and just, just the recommended varieties before I would forget. Uh, we really like Martin, we really like Tyson, and uh, say Tyson like Thomas, right? Tyson. And then JB30, we really like these three varieties out of the five that we have. So here's the first thing about June berries. You will need netting. The birds love these things. We have 100 plants. 100 plants is not enough to satisfy the birds. It's just not. Um, if you get them netted early enough, then the birds won't know that they can be harvesting these berries. But once they start and then you net them, they're gonna try for about three or four days and you'll find some birds under the net and in the net. And um, so we kind of run a rescue operation for a couple days to make sure the birds get out of that net. But uh, definitely some kind of netting. This netting is woven netting. It's very soft. It has about half inch um, holes in it. And then you can see how I hold it up. I use a soil probe and I make a hole in the ground uh, just with my foot and then uh, put in a piece of bamboo. And then on the right-hand side, these are plants in later years, actually it's last year, and I had to tape two pieces of bamboo together to get it up high enough. And then we still, uh, we put a pop can on top. You can choose something else, but a pop can is cheap and available, and that will keep the net from sliding down over the pole. So we'll just talk about the diseases right away. The one thing, um, I think it's in a handout, one thing I've heard from uh, researchers in Canada is you really can't grow June berries organically. Um, like I said, I thought we could because there's not a lot of other plants to, to transmit disease, but after about three or four years, we started seeing this disease, this Entomosporium leaf and berry spot. Um, some years it's just on the leaves. This picture is an extreme example of, I mean, we have never seen it this bad at Carrington. But it does get on the leaves, and I thought, well, not too much of a problem. But then one year, we probably had more rain that year, and actually the little spots got on the berries too. And it doesn't really affect the berries unless it were a really bad case. We must not have had it too bad. But it does, it does um, show the spots on the berries, and if you were to sell these for pies or something, maybe someone could tell, and you, you wouldn't want to do that. So we keep the plants thin by pruning, kind of. Um, remove those little shoots that are in there. You just want hardy shoots. Um, if you water your plants, do not water them on the leaves. Make sure you water the soil. And then keep your weeds down because those hold moisture and they could hold spores. Um, and then probably you are going to have to spray with some kind of a fungicide. And I know the fungicide that is available for homeowners is propiconazole. It's, it's very available. You don't want to use the same fungicide all the time. 
And I have to say, I was, did not have time to go through and look at another homeowner um, kind of fungicide. But if you need help on that, I, just contact me at the Carrington Research Center, and then um, I will help you find that information. Here's our next disease that we also get. These two are kind of tied for pests here in North Dakota. Woolly elm aphids. Um, you may have heard me talk about this before, but when your elm tree pees on you, when you get little drops on your picnic table or on your car, that is not your elm tree doing that. That is your aphids on the elm trees doing that. They are sucking the moisture out of the elm leaves and then they are exuding it from their bodies. So they are peeing sap on you or sweet nectar on you. Um, but these aphids are on the elm, elm leaves for a couple generations and then in kind of mid-June, early July, they leave the elm trees and they go to the Juneberry plants and they find them. And what they do is they kind of suck on the root hairs and they can cause these spongy kind of roots. And you can see this in this picture, it's, it's a picture I took last year. There's like these knobs and the root is kind of enlarged but nothing's really happening. It's got these billion little shoots. So if your Juneberry plants have a lot of little shoots, it's actually not a good sign. That's a sign of this aphid on there. Um, it's hard to get around away from this. They say that ladybugs and surfeit flies will eat the aphids, and we do have those around here. Um, it's possible to net a new planting. If you just have some um, plants in your yard, you could keep them netted for like a month's time or so in that late June to July, uh, thin netting. Um, and there, there is a systemic insecticide you can apply. I would only apply it uh, when your plants are not blooming anymore or what, before they start blooming, you know, when they're quite young. That's when you really need it, when the plants are being established. Once they're established and get kind of old, they can actually handle the woolly elm feeding on there. And then I've been thinking, what about diatomaceous earth? Could you not sprinkle that around the top of the plant? Because that's where they get in. They get in, the, they, they land on the stems and then they walk down and they, get, they go into the root system right through the top of the plant. So I kind of wonder if you could just sprinkle a handful of diatomaceous earth right around the top of that plant. It, I think that might work. Aphids are kind of soft. So something to think about, something to try. And if you try it, you can let me know. And then rust. Uh, some years we, like two years ago, we saw quite a bit of rust. Prior to that, we had not seen very much. Every year we find a little, but usually not too much. And this rust is also a fungus. It's juniper apple rust, and you may hear it as cedar apple rust, but really um, it, it, it's, it, it's a disease that travels between the juniper species and then rosaceae species. And some parts of the country, like Michigan or maybe out east where it's more moist, you're gonna see a lot more problems with this because there's juniper trees and there's apple trees and, and some people have juneberry plants, so a lot of um, posts for them to go between. So like I said, we don't get it too bad. I've actually never seen the spores in the juniper plants, but obviously they're around. Uh, maybe I need to look harder. <laughs> so the galls on the junipers are kind of a grayish ball, and then when it rains, these like alien orange gooey tendrils come out of the, of the gall. So I have never seen that in person, but I've seen some great pictures of it. And a man sent me a picture of his juniper from up near Grand Forks area, and the tree was covered with them. And I said, this is so cool, and this is so terrible, I said. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I've never actually seen it in person. Um, anyway, so this, this disease goes between them. You want to avoid planting your juneberries near a juniper tree if you can. Not always possible in North Dakota. Uh, you can prune the galls out of the junipers, and you can spray with different fungicides. Again, propiconazole. And then uh, really, I've looked at Cornell in the past and uh, a paraffinic oil, it's like a very light oil, kind of like a horticulture oil. Uh, it is really the only compound that's recommended by Cornell University. So uh, there's just not many compounds or many chemicals li or licensed for use in, uh, in the US for, for June berries. And then this is a problem that may be unique to North Dakota, flower thrips. And the way to find out if you have thrips in your flowers is to take the flowers and you kind of cover it up and then you breathe on it, just a nice soft, uh, nice warm breath on it. And then you take your flower and then you shake it like over a piece of white paper. And then see, you'll see these tiny, tiny, tiny little tan 
insects. They're, they're so tiny, but then they'll start to walk on your paper. And that's how you see if you have thrips. And then the other symptom is what you see on this flower here. Uh, there's these little brown markings on the flower. And that's where the thrips have been sucking and chewing on the flowers. It doesn't look too bad here, but these flowers won't open up properly. And then when you get to the fruit, it's going on the top. So here you have your fruit, and this is the blossom end, and this is the stem end. On this blossom end, it's going to be kind of open and a gray woody scar on there. Like if you were to, you could eat it, but it would be kind of chewy, and you, it would be kind of like eating part of the stem is what it would feel like in your mouth. Um, so it's really kind of a nasty little thing. Um, not, it's not in the Canadian literature, so I think we just see it here in North Dakota. We use three things. They're both, they're, all three are organic products. We use Azagard, and we use Spinosad and Piganic, and I kind of rotate through those things. I have to say, I'll spray, and then a couple days later, I will check for thrips. They're still there, but I think they must just stop feeding. And I did read something after noticing that. I read something that the Azagard actually does stop feeding by the, by the thrips, so um, it works. It's pretty, it's pretty nice. Not too hazardous to us. And then we have fire blight. You know, we do see fire blight. We don't see it in our apple trees. We, one year we had an apple trees at the research center. But uh, in the, in the um, June berries, we see a little bit every year. And you get this dead branch, like in this picture. Um, it kinda, uh, the shepherd's crook is that kind of falls over. The branch dies so quickly that it's very soft. And then it, it, the tip tips over. And in that time, it's starting to dry out already. So it kind of holds that shape. So it's very sudden. The, the shoots just wilt uh, very suddenly. Uh, it's a bacterial problem. So the, the, it is actually spread by like rain and your pruning tools. And then bees, when bees are pollinating your apples or your June berries, the bacteria can get on the bees and the bees can carry it from flower to flower. And that's how it infects you know, your plants. So again, no products labeled for fire blight and June berries. So we just we would just prune that out and you know there i don't know if esther will talk about this or someone else but you can read about it the ugly stub method the ugly stub method of pruning out fire blight this is something we're using now in apple trees you cut it back and just leave it and then later you cut it back even further when the tree has gone dormant um as far as i know in june berries it's probably the same method we just cut so like a foot or so below. And Jimberry's a shrub, you can easily remove that whole branch and not have to worry. Like an apple tree, if you remove the whole branch, it might look kind of funny, but fine to do it in, a, in Juneberry. Okay, we're almost to the end. I wanted to put our resources up here. This is um, Growing Saskatoons, a manual for orchardists. This is the kind of Bible of, of Saskatoon production. This was um, maybe it's about 10 years old, <laughs> maybe it was from 99, but there wasn't anything except for this man doing this. Um, and then I recently bought the Saskatoon Berry Production Manual, the number two uh, picture there, and I just found out today that it is available for free for a download from open, um, open publications from Alberta. Um, so you can just download it. You can buy it also for $15, probably more shipping to the U.S. Anyway, and then the third resource is the Midwest Fruit Pest Management Guide. It has like when and what to spray for almost any crop you can think of. Juneberry is actually in there, I believe, but um, you know, Juneberry is very much in the apple family, so it shares a lot of diseases. So but that's a very good guide for you. All right, and then this is my list of plant sources. Where can we buy these plants in the US? It's not that easy. They don't propagate very easily. You might think, oh, I could just take a shoot that comes out of the ground, but there's no roots on that shoot. And uh, the normal methods that we use for propagating woody shoots just don't work really well on Juneberry. So they're kind of kind of hard to propagate. Um, but there are some sources here in the US, Saskatoon, Michigan, St. Lawrence Nursery, Honeyberry USA, and then there are some Canadian sources. If you want larger quantities of, of plants, you might go directly to a Canadian source for a little cheaper price, but shipping is about $60 a box. So there's that. So anyway, here's our sources. And then um, here's our picture, Juneberry pie. This is what it's all about. I think Juneberries were made for pie. They're just scrumptious. If you haven't had a chance to try it, uh, you should. If you haven't find Juneberry pie, give it a try. If you need my recipe, let me know. I'll put it on our Facebook page, I guess.
and then just thank you. A nice spring picture for you. And uh, have a great spring. Enjoy growing a lot of different fruits and try something new this year. It'll be fun. Thank you. Oh, there'll be Let's questions. get some questions. Yeah, don't go away. We, we want to here. Uh, first question you mentioned about netting. And did you see like a half inch mesh, something half like inch, that? About a half inch or five eighths inch me mesh. So since that is so indispensable, where is a good source for netting? Well, I order my netting from um, MDT and Associates. I don't know if we're supposed to give uh, yeah, names, ahead. but you know that is where I get it from. MDT and Associates is about twenty-one cents a foot, uh, but it is like sixteen hundred feet of it is quite a bit. But if you can share it with a neighbor. Uh, actually, for Juneberries, I sew two pieces together. I decide the length I want, lay a second piece over that, overlapping, and then I just take a dowel with holes drilled in it and some nylon thread, and I actually sew those together. So I actually have a 32-inch uh, piece of netting that goes over my my plants to keep to, to keep to keep it down on the ground so the birds can't get under there. But MDT and Associates are out of the cities. Very nice people to deal with. Prices are not on the internet, but you call them and they're very helpful. So that's where we get ours. And what, when do you put up the net? You can, you should put up the net when the berries have turned pink, but not really swelled yet. So harvest, okay. you can count on harvest around July 10th to the 15th. So about two weeks prior to that. Okay. Um, you ever heard of the variety called Regent? Was that discovered in North Dakota? Have you heard of Regent? Yes, I have never tasted Regent, but I hear it's not that good, and it is a North Dakota variety. I've just heard it's very bland and dry, kind of mealy, so um, I've not tried Regent. Do you have to plant more than one cultivar to get fruit? No, Juneberry, you can go okay. with one plant. They actually <laughs> hardly need to be fertilized, so uh, it kind of it, it's easy. Sometimes we look at the Juneberry, they got these little hair-like things on the fruit. Are they orange hair-like things? Mm. I think if they're is orange the and hair-like is the rust, it's the cedar apple rust. Yeah. And the, if you touch them at the right time, this orange mist of spores will get all over. Yeah. How about, uh, for, we got an entrepreneur here who's wondering, you've inspired him, and he's wondering, is there a commercial demand for Juneberries in North Dakota? I think there is. A lot of, uh, a lot of the jelly makers do Juneberries. There's people who make pies. You know, definitely if you want to grow any kind of fruit, you should try to find out what your market is. Talk to cafes and see if they would use Juneberries. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think about winemaking. People have tried it. It just doesn't have quite enough oomph and, and concentrated flavor for winemaking. But jelly makers and pie makers are your best bet. And then fresh sales. Um, prices are pretty good. We have. Uh, we do have about that I know of. We have about four to five Juneberry orchards in North Dakota that sell out of their. I think they sell out of their fruit every year. Oh, do you know how many acres are in North Dakota? About no. like earth is like I would less than five acres. Commercial, I would say about five acres, maybe. So there's not very much an opportunity to say there's an opportunity, our, I think. A delicious uh opportunity there. Okay, how about you know, um sometimes they, people see June berries at available to their soil conservation district. Are those varieties or just wild June berries? Those or? are seedlings from <laughs> soil conservation. <laughs> And I, you should ask soil conservation, and I should make a point of calling them. What I have read is they are now growing seedlings from some of these more superior varieties of Juneberry. So things like Martin and Teeson and North, Northline, they're collecting uh, seeds from those better varieties and then planting those out to sell to people. That is what I've heard. But I know other people who have established Juneberry patches from soil conservation. Some people get fruit, some people don't. So. Yeah, we have one person from Burley County who had that experience, and he says that there, it does have berries, but they never grow larger than a small pea. <laughs> um, doesn't know the variety, so he's wondering, should he try a new variety? I would try Depends. a new variety. I really, like if small. it's a small pea, that's probably more for the birds <laughs> than for... 
I'm trying to variety. <laughs> really going to be like small peas, <laughs> and you don't have to. Otherwise, if you want something a little more substance, might be a good idea. <laughs> um, are June berries self pollinating? <clears throat> I'm going to say yes. I think that they hardly need to be pollinated. I think they're they kind of uh, form their seeds with no pollen needed for the most part. So um, you can just have one plant and get June berries. Many plants, though, it's good to have two varieties, and maybe you have a little different ripening time. So, but I think you can just have one plant. You mentioned using diatomaceous earth as a possible way to control those root aphids. Mm -hmm. right. So, how would you? You just, would get a bag of it, and you would just take a little dust, little measuring right? spoon or something, and just dust it right around the. I would say the crown of the plant. Just spread it around that crown of the plant, so that the aphids would have to go through it to get to the roots. How about a spot spray with insecticide instead? Well, it's just hard because those, you have to see them when they are on the plant, but once they get on the plant, they crawl right down to the roots and then they're covered by soil. So it's really hard to spray an insecticide on them. Um, have you seen actual damage ca caused by woolly elm aphid to older Juneberry plants? Well, they have them. Ours are 10 years old this year, and I know they have the damage. I showed you that root where it looks all knobby, and what you see are weak shoots coming out of the base of the plant, and that is from woolly elm aphid damage. Uh, if, if we controlled all of the aphids, there would be really nice, hardy, healthy shoots coming out of them, but when you have a lot of small shoots, that's indicative of woolly elm aphid damage. We just want to reinforce out there about that uh, rust, because uh, those hairs can be grayish before they sporulate. Huh? They're kind of green. They're kind of grayish. a light green before they turn orange. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> how about uh, how do you handle getting your stuff from a Canadian nursery? If you buy a large quantity from a Canadian nursery, they will have a plant inspector come in and they inspect the box before it gets shipped to you. And that inspection costs, as far as I know, about $20. So that's on you. And then uh, the shipping, they'll send it by their like uh, quick post, although it's not often that quick, depending on how the trucks go. And then um, that's about $60. And I believe you probably have to sign, you may have to get an APHIS, A-P-H-I-S, it's USDA APHIS service. Uh, you might have to get an APHIS import permit, which is free. You just have to do it call the APHIS office in Bismarck and they can help you out and tell you what the form name is you need to fill out. Not hard, it's not hard. So the Canadian option seems to be something when you were really getting into this big time. We're not just buying three or four plants. If you were, we're buying like hundreds, you would want to buy plants. right from Canada. Right. And there is that nursery that is, they sell seedlings on my slide there. And you can use seedlings from from these varieties. If it's a known variety, you can use seedlings from that known variety. Once you grow those out, it's not a good idea to uh, take seeds from them because they're a little more removed from the parent block. But definitely seedlings are okay and cheaper. A question about the netting again. How do you secure the netting to the ground? Well, I leave my netting long. I said that I, I sew two pieces together and then so it's extra long. And then I use those garden staples. They're U-shaped, like hanger wire or whatever, but you buy them, garden staples. And then we just push them in the ground about every five feet, something like that. At every, at every bamboo post, we stick them in, and then maybe one in between. Have you seen uh, chlorosis on June berries? We see chlorosis on a few plants in that planting. And I know some of the soil was more shallow than others, didn't have as much black soil. Um, so we do see a little chlorosis. You could apply sulfur somewhat, but um, you could also apply, um, um, I can't think of it, maybe it's just sulfur. <laughs> but if, you if your soil is really high in pH, you know, it's so hard to change it. Um, if your soil is really high in pH, I would maybe not do Try it. a different crop. Try a different crop. <laughs> Try aronia. Yeah, try aronia. <clears throat> but uh, that's a good, but then you may have a good comment there. Get a soil test done. Yeah. Find out the pH and see, like, is it higher than 7.5 or, you know, yeah. is it like really high that's going to be really if hard? If you're getting to 7.7, seven, seven, if you're higher than 7.7, seven, seven, that's when you're going to really start to see problems in our soil. 
Um, contact your local extension agent, look online for soil tests. NDSU extension agents can help you do a soil test and they can help you interpret their results, how it applies to your area that you want to plant. And do this the year before you plant so you know uh, what you might need to do to adjust your soil. How about, uh, you said you shouldn't plant June berries near junipers. junipers. How about spruce trees? That's just fine. They're a whole mm -hmm. genus and a whole different family. So spruce trees are okay. Can you, uh, but don't plant spruce trees because they get a lot of diseases themselves. <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting into well, the what tree. What do you side. want? <laughs> Silk plants? Everything gets diseases. How about, uh, can you uh, talk a little bit about your masterful pruning technique? Like when do you do it? Uh, you said you targeted the, the little the little uh, sprouts in the ground. Yeah, my master you have, pruning technique. Can you technique. spend a minute and describe it? Give me you, a little stress. And when do you do it? Is now a good time to do it? A month ago would be a good time. A month ago is better. No. <laughs> you know, it was hard this year because we had so much snow in the orchard. And I should have, uh, I mean, really stuff should be pruned probably by another week or so because of the way the weather's going. But I couldn't even get in there because there was so much snow. And now all of a sudden it's 60 degrees. But you want to do it before your buds break dormancy. So for apples, it's usually the end of March, early April now. And um, plants that bud a little earlier, like currants and hascaps, even earlier than that. I haven't even gotten to those yet this year. Um, hmm. Yeah, you want to, if, if, if this is your stem, you want to, if this is a, the shoot you want to remove, you cut it off right here. You don't want to cut it off here because what's left oh, is a stub. And the stub will rot and eventually it could move disease down into the lower part of the branch. Uh, it, uh, it's just ugly, so no stubs. You just want to cut it off right there, right there. <laughs> Kathy, are you going to discuss honeyberries? Just say no. No, we are running out of time. That's right, we They're don't have time. Though. Give Sorry, them a try. start billings, but uh, the good thing about this is Kathy has talked about honeyberries or has caps in the past at Spring Fever. Go to the Spring Fever website. Oh, and look at the archives, it's all there for you. Uh, what's better, sun or shade, getting back to June berries? Oh, sun, sun. Keep those diseases away, let them dry up early in the morning before the humidity gets all that fungus going on them. How about, has that dreaded pest spotted wing drosophila affected your June berries? Yes. Ugh. Yes? Yes, it's terrible. Uh, get your June berries picked as soon as possible. My new theory is, to do that, pick them early. You know, they don't have to be totally ripe. They actually will have more pectin when they're a little less ripe. So if you want to make jam out of them or even pie, they'll be a little more tangy and they'll be more pectin. Um, but get them off as soon as you can. It, those, the fruit fly shows up about July 10th. How about, uh, have you ever thought about using a product like a root starter for propagating June berries? Oh, they've tried everything. Um, the university oh, here has done tissue culture on them and they will tissue culture they'll form little plants on the medium but then you have to take them from there and put them in another something or other to make them form roots that's the hard part getting them to actually from the little leaky part to making roots that's the hard part they're just a weird funky unhelpful plant to propagate how about uh organic uh fungicides like besides that you know, like I have copper, mill stuff. Well, you could use copper. Copper's kind of toxic to humans. Oh. <laughs> it can build up in your soil. So um, it's actually not the best for us, for our safety. Uh, the commercial fungicides are actually probably safer to you as a human. Um, but there, you know, there's things like mill stop. There's um, actinovate. It's one of the actinomyces. It's possible to use something like that, a bacteria that, will hopefully keep the funguses off. So many things to try. Okay, we got a comment about spotted wing drosophila in Fargo on June berries. It only they only occur at the end of the harvest season. At that time picking the fruit before it gets very dark colored. If you do that like you were recommending, it gets ahead of the insect problem. And get them frozen. Get those berries frozen as soon as possible because uh, that will stop that little worm in its tracks. You know, it goes in as an egg and within a few days it becomes the little maggot. But if you can stop it when it's still uh, an egg or a very, very tiny worm, you know, then you'll never notice that you're eating it. Don't worry about it. Just 
bake it in a pie. <laughs> okay, Kathy. Yeah, right. They're perfectly edible. They're perfectly edible. Yeah. yeah. They taste you... better with June berries. <laughs> uh, do you wash your June berries before you freeze them? Uh, we do not. We do not. We just get them in the freezer as soon as possible. And then when they're frozen, I run them underwater. Okay. Any last questions out there? Okay, seeing none. Thank you, Kathy. Okay, thanks, thanks everybody. It was excellent. Okay, have really a great spring. It. Thank you. Okay, everybody, we're going to take about a five minute break before our next talk. We're going to learn how to graft an apple tree. There you go. Take a break.